um, end days we're going to be going through, a lot of that. So anyway, I think in those end days, we'll find that he's more so walking the whole entire time <laughs> instead of us sometimes. And I've, um, I don't know if everybody else has realized this, but it seems like he has us do what we are capable of doing and where we are not capable, he fills that in. And it's like he's our spiritual eyes when our physical eyes can't meet, you know, what we need them to meet. So I'm going to sing this song. It's called Footprints in the Sand. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. This week I had an opportunity to sing this song with, um, at Rosa's school this week because her kids, I've been um, teaching them every Tuesday music, yeah, and help them learn to sing. So that was fun. And um, then I just topped it off. What, this Tuesday was my last day, and we topped it off with this song. And it was a fun thing to do. They like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Well, it's, try, it's hard to get kids to want to sing. Yeah. doesn't have ads in the middle of your song. <laughs> That's usually the problem. <laughs> um, Leona Lewis and its footprints in the sand. Let's see what pulls up. <laughs> My phone has ads. <laughs> No, it's, hmm. yeah, because there's different um, karaoke versions. Leona, mm -hmm. Leona Lewis. Huh, don't know why it won't play, it's so weird. Footprints in the Yeah, just. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why don't, why don't you go and do your thing? And maybe if you want, I can get up here afterwards after I figure out something else. <laughs> okay, our scripture reading is from Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me, 
all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a promise. is good.
Thank you, Natalie, to be reminded of the imminent presence of our Creator and our Savior. This morning we're going to talk about something that I have termed the image prevention or preservation syndrome. It's one of the oldest degenerative or wasting disease processes in this universe, contributed to by selfishness, by pride, and by envy. First, we're going to take a look at uh, the commonality of it. Then we'll take a look at the therapy for its vertical component, and then we'll take a look at the therapy for the horizontal component. The image preservation syndrome, or IPS as I'll call it, began quickly in the first human utterings after our breaking allegiance with God in the Garden of Eden. Adam answered God with the implication that the problem was with God's view of sensuality. <coughs> then man's next sentence, that was in verse 11 of Genesis 3, he spread the blame to the woman, then back to God, called blame transference, abdicating full and even partial responsibility of wrongdoing. Then woman's first response was to place blame on the serpent and then back on God. And mankind's next recorded response to God was Cain's outright denying of reality, never owning the action, self-righteously avoiding the blame, and then blaming God for lack of interrelational understanding. Don't you know that I'm going to be killed if you send me out? Uh, <coughs> Genesis 4, 9. Fallen human mankind's propensity of self-justification through denial and blame transfers did not abate. Moses blamed the complaining people in Deuteronomy 3.26 for his misrepresentation of God at the rock. And then Aaron blamed the people and metallic evolution for the golden calf. Then we had King Saul blaming his disobedience on the soldiers and his fear of the people in 1 Samuel 15, 15 through 24. Jonah blamed his anger on there being a God who was gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, Jonah 4, 1 and 2. To own and accept responsibility for one's thoughts and actions is a frightening uncovering of self, thus rare in fallen mankind. To have a heart sorrow for shortcomings uh, comes only from humility born in the cauldron of divine other-centered love. In the book of Job, we see the, and let's take a look, open our Bibles to Job chapter 1. And here we will see the originator of blame transference, the originator of the image preservation syndrome. And... Uh, that's a book just before Psalms, which we were studying this morning. And we find in 112, uh, we find the beginning, actually, begin, uh, maybe verse 7. We'll start with, the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Had the Lord ever met Satan before, the adversary? He knew who he was. But he didn't welcome him with anger or anxiety or irritation, but with great uh, uh, kindness. Uh, where are you from? Where are you going? I, I'm going to and for on the earth and walking up and down on it, uh, implying that he owned the earth. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There, there is none like him. Uh, on the earth, blameless and upright who fears God and turns away from evil. Immediately, you see in verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear him for no reason? Immediately implying that, you know, God, you're wrong. You only, Job only likes you because you give him gifts. You protect him. That's the only reason why. So he immediately denied what the Lord was saying. Uh, then Satan answered the Lord, no reason. Have you put a hedge around him 
and a house and all on every side. You've blessed the work of his hands and the possession increased. Night. But stretch out your hand. Notice what he's doing here. He's transferring what he will do onto God. Okay? Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Now, the next phrase is probably one of the most uh, what would you say? One of the most phenomenal phrases in Scripture in recorded hip. God graciously and quietly sets the record straight, giving Satan permission to use Satan's hands in Job 1, 9 through 12. And this same scenario was repeated, uh, first of all, his possessions, and then in chapter 2, 6, uh, uh, for his body. Job trusted God and God trusted Job. But the adversary was trying to put what he would do onto God. And the patience and kindness of what God said, behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. No anger, no irritation, no rebuttal, no saying you're wrong, but just quietly, patiently, with respect, still dealing with the most significant enemy in the universe. And though Job did not descend to blaming God, Job 1, 22, he didn't. Even though in his innocence he said God took away, 1, 12, while he was questioning why, in 9, 24, he said, if it's not God, then who? To recognize your wrong and to break from denial and transference of blame to recognizing, admitting, and confessing a wrong taking responsibility and experiencing true-hearted sorrow, as David did in Psalms 38, 18, are some of the most difficult repeated steps to be taken out of the slew of selfishness. It's accompanied only with our eyes, accomplished only with our eyes focused on the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. Now, <coughs> The image preservation syndrome, vertical therapy is found in the Bible in three steps. It begins with responding to the gracious invitation of Christ in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Nathan so well read, come unto me all ye that labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come unto me is the beginning. Then the next two steps have to do with confession and confession is intimately tied with repentance. And we can speak of the two separately, but we cannot separate them. You cannot confess without repentance. And you cannot repent without confession. And we'll take a look at that. Confession means to admit your own fault, own your own fault, to disclose your own fault. That's what confession means. 1 John 1, 9, we talk, if we confess our sins, what has to come first before he can forgive us our sins? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So Proverbs 28, 13, he who co covers his own sins will not prosper. What does God want us to do? He wants us to prosper. <coughs> will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes, we'll talk about that a little later, them will have mercy. Matthew 3, 6 says, All of Jerusalem and Judea went out to him, that was John the Baptist, confessing their sins. It has to start with confession. A very difficult thing. Let's take a look at the book of Daniel. And we'll take, that's a book right after Ezekiel, Daniel chapter 9 is a fascinating one. 
verse 3, we'll start with, and we won't read it all. But it says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him with prayer and pleads for mercy and sackcloth and ashes. He was confessing, New International Version, his sins. Is there any recording of his sins in the scripture? Not that I've ever found. So what was he confessing? You'll find in the next 16 verses, he confessed our sins. 20 times in 16 verses. Confessing, saying, I admit that we have sinned. I admit that I am a part of that sinful group. Interesting to note that repent has been, you know, confession about 50 times, repent 74 times in Scripture, means a turning away or 180 degree going from where you were heading. Now, in Ezekiel 14, 6 and 18, 30, it says, repent and turn from your sins. Uh, Young's literal translation, turn back. Yes, turn back from your sins. Repent is an absolute necessity after confession. Because I can say I did wrong, but I'm not going to do anything different. And the result is only sadness in the relationship. And we'll work with that in a little bit. John the Baptist, Matthew 3, 2, said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus in Matthew 4, 17 started the same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Disciples started in Acts 2.38, actually 2.38, repent and be baptized that your sins may be blotted out. Now, <coughs> in that famous allegory by John Bunyan, you had Christian. And Christian started in the city of sin and went through the slew of selfishness and he had a big burden on his back. And he went from that slew of selfishness to, if you remember, the wicket gate. And that's W-I-C-K-E-T. And that particular name means small and yielding. That's what you have to be to confess your sins. You have to admit you sin. If you don't admit it, you got pride there. <laughs> keeping you from it. And that's part of that image preservation syndrome. Well, <coughs> after he went through the wicket gate, he was able, with the confession, he was able to get on the path to the celestial city. And you remember, he was able to then go by the cross of Christ and relieve the burden off his back. But as he went along, he had two friends come in. They didn't go through the wicket gate. They didn't confess. They didn't repent. What were their names? Remember? Formalist and hypocrisy. They hopped on and, boy, they could talk about Christianity. But they didn't make it very far on the path to the celestial city. Because if you confess your sins, then he is faithful and just. You have to know you sinned and then confess it. Now, <coughs> that's the beginning to get on the path to the kingdom of heaven. But it's not just the beginning. It has to happen repeatedly. That's what David found when Nathan the prophet came up and said, hey, buddy, <laughs> you remember what happened to Bathsheba? You know, you need to repent. And he asked for a clean heart. He did confess and repent at that point. Now, you feel small when you're doing that. Do you notice, have you ever noticed we're studying Psalms in the uh, uh, Sabbath school lesson. A few weeks ago, we had Psalms 22, which is the psalm that Christ was quoting some aud audibly, some quietly to himself on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what did he say there in, uh, uh, that would be 22.6? He said, 
for such a worm as I. He felt that smallness of humanity that is sin. He took that burden on himself of my sin and your sin. He was going through the wicked gate at that point. How about us? Do we need still to be going through that wicked gate at times, not just at the beginning? What did Revelation chapter 3 tell us? As we got to the end of it, verse 17, it says to Christians, you are wretched, miserable, poor, that's us, especially to the Laodicean church, all churches, and even the Seventh-day Adventist church in the latter days, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. We have our fig leaves on just like Adam and Eve did. And yes, we need to confess. We need repentance even now on the pathway to the kingdom of heaven. Now, <coughs> That's confession and repentance, the three steps that are necessary, coming to Christ, confession, repentance, on the upward path. But there is also a challenge on the horizontal level for each one of us. Horizontal in relationships between fallen humans. Yes, these three steps are vital, but humans make mistakes all the time, all people, and as some have readily said in the scientific literature, we are all walking offenders. We don't think about that, do we? But we are all walking offenders due to our self-centeredness. And apologies, that's what we call confession and repentance on the horizontal level, are the glue that holds us together as humans. When we offend someone, whether or not we feel we are to blame, we should apologize. The goal, goal of confession and repentance or an apology on the horizontal is not to establish right and wrong. We'll always think, I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> that's our desire. But it that's, has nothing to do with it. It's reconciliation and restoration. That's what an apology is for. That's what confession and repentance are for. Just different names. We're putting together confession and repentance in the one word apology. An apology is about restoring trust, respect, and the bonds of love. It's not about you, whether you're right or wrong, but it's about relationships and human beings the most direct measure of joy and happiness is in their social relationships. And as we fray those relationships, if we leave them frayed, our happiness goes down. It doesn't matter if we can convince the other people or attempt to the other person that we're right and they're wrong. Confession and repentance and especially on the horizontal level, apologies has nothing to do with right and wrong. It has to do with restoration of that relationship. Seek to bless, not to justify or impress. The therapy for the image preservation syndrome in the horizontal, yes, is called an apology and can be broken down uh, depending on scientifically who you look at, somewhere between three to five steps. And I'll be using here uh, some of the counsel in this area from uh, Harvard University and also from Dr. Aaron Lazier, who is the chancellor and the dean, or was former, he just passed away, of uh, University of, uh, uh, University of M Massachusetts Medical School. And uh, whether you're looking at lumpers or splitters, we'll put it into five and you'll see it fits right into the uh, category of confession and repentance. Number one, express, and the reason I use Dr. Lazier is he is known as the world authority on apologies on the human level. 
horizontal level. Express true regret for the hurtful effects you did. You might have been right, you might have been wrong, but the way you approached it broke down a relationship. And you need to express regret for the hurtful effects that you did. To accept responsibility for the specific mistake. Not just on my horizontal, I'm fine, I'm a sinner, God. <laughs> No, what was your sin? What specifically did you do that frayed that relationship? Three, request forgiveness. If you don't request forgiveness, it, uh, uh, you've not stepped into the reality that you need forgiveness. <clears throat> In other words, you've never carried that load on your back as Christian had as he went through the wicked gate and on up to the cross. Four, repent. That means turn 180 degrees sincerely, uh, and then five, make restitution. In other words, I'm going to put the uh, uh, alarm on on my clock so we're, I'm not going to miss our dinner date next time. I'm going to say I'm sorry for breaking your glass or your window or whatever it is, and I'll, I'll replace it the best I can. Five steps, express regret, accept responsibility, request forgiveness, repent, and make restitution. Confession and repentance vertically or apology horizontally are about humbling yourself, 1 Peter 5, 6, that he may exalt you. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt. Not that we exalt. That's what a typical what we'll call non-apologetic apology has to do with, okay? Uh, <coughs> and maybe we'll talk about that right now because we often make an apology into a non-apologetic apology. Very, very common. Most apologies you see on this earth are that way, and that's why folk who study it point out such as, I'm sorry you feel or took it that way. You know, that's passive-aggressive buck-passing and has no empathy, empathy with it. Or, I never intentionally set out to upset you. That means a total lack of sincerity, real ownership, or accountability, and no empathy. And as Dr. Lazier pointed out, again, adding any modifier such as, well, but, just, if, derails the apology. In other words, well I, or well you, or but I, but you. Yeah, we, we saw that with Adam and Eve, didn't we? Okay. Or I just, or if you. It's not about self-justification. The goal of confession and repentance, or an apology, is reconciliation and restoration of a relationship. Bringing back to others and others and yourself the joy of living. Because joy in humans has to do with relationship. It's not how many tools you have out in your shop or that your pantry's fully stocked. It doesn't have to do with the new car that you just bought. The joy in relationships is the reality of joy in a person's life. And so that's what you want to restore. That's the whole concept of restoring <coughs> and apology. Uh, blame avoidance on the horizontal plane, a continuing reality. Uh, <coughs> well, I was recently in the presence of a Christian man and woman. And the man, uh, I heard him ask, uh, why do we argue to the wife sitting next to him? And the woman said, because you open your mouth. Again, blame transference immediately, okay? Uh, she didn't use denial. Uh, she just used blame transference. How deep a human failing is self-justification or the image preservation syndrome? Maybe it's a direct denial of a wrong or maybe denial via transference of guilt. That's why John, the former son of thunder, wrote, if we claim we have not sinned, that means been an error, fallen short. His word, that's the living word of God, is not in us, John 1, 9. 
That would go along with Colossians 1.27, Christ in us is the hope of glory. If we don't have Christ in us through confession, repentance, and appropriate apology, Christ is not there. That's what John was saying. And why Christ said, he who falls on the stone, that would be Jesus Christ, will be broken. His pride, his self-protectionism, his self-justification to pieces. That's going through the wicked gate, which we have to, as humans, repeatedly go through every day if we're going to stay on that road to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and it's a necessity before we can see our value in his eyes and allow God to remake us anew. If we confess our sins, he is always there to renew us, owing to the action of falling on the rock and shattering ourselves. He is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Humility. Humility is a state of being humble. Humble is unpretentious submission, being not proud. It means a spirit of deference. Deference means respect, regard, submission to another's opinion. That's very difficult, isn't it? Submission to another's opinion. Exodus 10.3 says, How long will you refuse to humble yourself? That wasn't just to the nation of Israel. Remember, Israel also means Israelites. It's plural. We are the Israel of God. The overcomers, that's what it means, Israel. <coughs> How long will you refuse to humble yourself? Humble yourselves, 1 Peter 5, 6, under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. When your name comes before the judgment seat, how many of you think the question will come, well, what did your friend do to you, your boss? your co-worker, your brother, your sister, your spouse. God knows all that. He'll never ask you that. What he will be asking, did you reveal to them my character? When the neighbor's dog came over and kept uh, uh, using his toilet on your lawn, did you reveal to your neighbor and to the dog my character? Right? That's the question that will be asked of us. His compassion, his kindness, his gentleness, his goodness, his mercy, his patience, just like he had patience with the adversary there in Job. Did you reveal that? To be able to keep that relationship and be able to turn that neighbor into a Christian brother and sister? Proverbs 28.13, he who covers his sin, <coughs> it's be the harming of a relationship, human, divine, called confession, repentance, or human to human, will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. What does mercy mean? You know, God is fair. He'll treat us as we have treated others. Mercy means refraining from enforcing what is due. How many of you here are sinners? Don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What's due us is not anything better than what's due Satan. He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Matthew 5.5, 5, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. <clears throat> what does meek do? What does that mean to you? Meekness means enduring injury, whether real or or supposed with patience and without resentment. That's what Christ was doing as he met the adversary there in Job chapter 1 and 2. And we can only do that in 
our horizontal relationships as we've come to Christ and ask him to live out his life within us, to have that patience that passes all understanding. Not rebuttaling, not ruminating later about problems with this person or that person, but as we say with, uh, uh, as they said with Abraham Lincoln, with honesty, a knee-jerk honesty, a knee-jerk patience, to repair that relationship, that's what an apology is all about. <coughs> so the Oman, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, invites and encourages us in Revelation 19 to do what? Revelation 3.19, it says, be zealous and repent. That's that knee-jerk response. When you feel that you have been injured, immediately, with empathy, understand if the other person has been injured and recognize your part in an apology, confessing and repenting of that behavior that frayed the relationship. That's what an apology is all about, is restoring relationships, which will only restore their happiness and our happiness. Let's stand together as we have closing song, Jesus I Come 292. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness into thy health. Out of my want and into thy wealth. Out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the glorious gain of thy cross, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of her sorrow into thy balm, out of my storms and into thy calm, out of distress to jubilant song, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of unrest, and arrogant pride. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy blessed will to abide. Jesus, I come to thee out of myself to dwell in thy love, out of despair and rapture of Upward for I on wings of a dove, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the joy and light of thy home. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the depths of ruin untold, into the peace of thy sheltering fold, ever thy glorious face to behold. Jesus, I come to thee. Kind Father, <clears throat> it's only as we come to you 
can we go not only initially, but every day? Often, as <coughs> it seems to be in human behavior, commonly six times a day we should come and allow ourselves to go through that wicked gate, to humble and quietly, through your grace and power, to repair the relationship, yes, with you and with each one around us. Thank you for giving us that wisdom and that power to do it with Christ in us. May he become truly our hope of glory. In Christ's precious and holy name.